So just want to welcome everybody to our, our first book club discussion for the Tennis IQ podcast. Um, I know that some of you may just be here to kind of observe, which is great. Um, no problem with that. If you would like to participate as we go through some some questions and discussion and perhaps uh, just sharing of memories of the book. Um, probably the easiest way is to raise your hand. So if you uh, don't know how to do that, there is a reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. And if you click on that, you'll see something to raise your hand. And what we'll see here on our side is you'll you'll jump to the top of the screen and we'll know to call on you and we'll see your hand raised. Um, or you could put something in the chat that you would like to, you know, uh, contribute. All right. Um, so with that, Josh, let's talk a little bit about the book in general. Um, so the, yeah, the name of the book, and we, I think we picked this one because seemingly most everyone's read it <laughs> at Plays Tennis. Um, so the inner game of tennis and, and sort of the new subtitle is the classic guide to the mental side of peak performance. So author is uh, W. Timothy Galway, Tim Galway, it was published in 1974. Uh, it's still the best seller in tennis coaching books on Amazon. It's probably the best selling tennis book um, in, in history. So over two million copies sold that that number is probably out of date. Um, and for those of you who don't know much about Tim Galway, um, he played at Harvard. He was the captain of the team and at a certain point became very interested in mindfulness and, and meditation. Um, and that had a profound influence on how he coached the game and, and just what he noticed. And he, he began to notice that some players were able to fix their technical issues on their own when they were sort of left to their own devices. And so he as detailed in the book, started to talk less and model more and 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 really uh, change his whole approach to coaching. So um, fascinating book. Um, and Josh, maybe to get the, the conversation started, um, even though we've got some questions here about overall impressions and so forth, I'm gonna go to the, the, the sub bullet. What was your first experience with the book? And the reason I'm gonna ask you this question, Josh, is because in your posts about the book, you mentioned that this is the one that really piqued your interest in sports psychology. So, you know, when did you read it? How did you apply it maybe first? Uh, what really appealed to you? Yeah, so I would say it was this and and Winning Ugly that were really the the two, two of the, the biggest catalysts to um me starting to to think about tennis as more than just a a physical sport and you know a sport where people have their forehands backhands serves and maybe somebody loses their temper but maybe that's not necessarily maybe maybe the mental side of the game wasn't i wasn't thinking about it as much as as a way to really improve performance i i more so more saw it as as a deficit at times that I had and other people had where they would, you know, lose their temper, lose their focus, things, things like that. Um, and yeah, winning ugly came a little earlier. It was when I was in high school, um, inner game of tennis, I read during college. Um, and yeah, sort of, I, I liked that it took a pretty different approach from winning ugly, which I'm sure some, some of you have read as well. And, uh, very different sort of approach where I think Brad Gilbert's approach in winning ugly was about sort of, doing a lot of thinking, thinking about all different aspects of the game, thinking about your own game, thinking about your opponent's game, thinking about how you pack your bag, thinking about a lot of different strategic aspects of things. And Inner Game of Tennis, on the other hand, um, felt very opposite in that it was a lot about how to think less, how to quiet your mind, how to simplify things. Um, so I think it, it definitely resonated with me and yeah, during college as I was, you know, sort of figuring out what came next and had this interest in that tennis and, and the mental side of tennis broadly, it, I think it, it definitely, um, yeah, hit, hit home with me and furthered that interest. And in, I, I think was one of the big factors that, that led me into a career in sports psychology. 
And I agree with your assessment of the difference between Winning Ugly and, and this book. I think I read this book prior to Winning Ugly being published. So I read it probably 1990 and I was 22, 23 years old. And I remember shortly after finishing the book, the, the, the thing that really stuck with me, the big idea, I, at least at first, it's maybe not the big idea that I would choose now was the idea of just focusing on your breathing between points. So at the time, I was playing in this really high level mixed doubles league, probably be like from an NTRP, like a 10, 10 10.0 plus. There were some really good players. And so I decided to try this, this breathing thing, just trying to focus on, on that. And it created a peak performance that day. You know, you can always remember a lot of the peak performance matches that you've had. And that was one of them. And I just focused on the breathing and I let it go. And, and so I wanted to find a really good quote in the book. And so um, here's one that I highlighted about breathing. So when the mind is fastened to the rhythm of breathing, it tends to become absorbed and calm. Whether on or off the court, I know of no better way to begin to deal with anxiety than to place the mind on one's breathing process. And I think in this quote, you can you can see some of the impact of med meditation and mindfulness on how Galway was thinking. And, you know, 1990, 22 years old, I, this is a completely foreign concept to me. I, I am a player who typically gets frustrated, bad temper, a lot of self-talk. And just this one little thing was amazing to try. Um, so, you know, is there any, you know, you can use or raise your hand or put something in the chat. Anybody else want to share perhaps, you know, their overall, their impressions of the book or an experience that they had right after reading it? And it's okay if, if not. Now, Bruce Barron. All right, Bruce. So, you know, this obviously is a seminal book that came out about not just tennis, but life as well. And the one thing I remember from the book that stuck with me is just focus on the ball bounce. I don't know if he said bounce hit or something like that, but you know, he was, he was teaching some people how to play tennis. And instead of worrying about get your racket back, turn your shoulders, it was just watch the ball, hit the ball. And if you see someone like Federer, any picture of Federer, Federer, he is just solely focused I'm watching the ball. And to me, that was, and even to this day, when I get out of rhythm, you know, I try and get back to just focus on the ball, see the ball, see the fuzz on the ball, watch the ball. And so that was, you know, the big takeaway for me uh, from this book. Excellent. Anyone else? All right, Weston. Yeah, I'll, I'll add my, uh, from what I re remember of it, I've got Winning Ugly and the Inner Game of Tennis now uh, next to my computer here, but I had to run back to my my bookshelf. But I, I remember it being um, a great book. I probably read it, might've read it early on in high school. So it's been um, a good, I don't know, what is that, like 10, 10 years at this point, nine mm -hmm. years since I've read it. But um, what I remember specifically is, the difference between self one and self two, I think yeah. is one of the concepts dragged on through the book. And Brian, I think you, you touched on that um, kind of in your um, explanation or, or opening um, some of the concept of it, but I remember kind of, I, I might be wrong in the specifics, but maybe like self one being a more sort of rational um, judgmental, maybe side of um, I, I would say maybe like the frontal lobe or something, although I don't think he says that. And then self two kind of being, some aspect of the back of the brain that is instinctual and that is learning maybe through vision as, as Bruce um, mentioned, right? And is not trying to learn from language to like bodily action. It's like kind of trying to learn from the body. And then maybe you could express that in language somehow. Um, but it kind of got me thinking a bit uh, too of what I studied in college um, in philosophy, which is um, a subject called consciousness, which is kind of um, connected in neuroscience. And it's a lot about, yeah, how the brain kind of is connected to the body 
um, why we have subjective experiences from our brain. And there's something about self too, that again, taps into like time slowing down and being able to see the ball um, faster. And I'm sure everyone's had, like people have had the experience of being in the zone. Seems like Federer and Djokovic and, and Nadal have, have it a lot more <laughs> than, than, than everyone else. But uh, yeah, it reminds me of that. And so somehow tapping into self too, um, while staying positive, I think they have an interplay um, with self one, but yeah, that's what I remember. Um, and it was a super interesting concept. And yeah, I remember that um, just from like hearing the title again from when I read it. So uh, yeah. Yeah. You're right on Weston in terms of your assessment of self one and self two. And it's very cool that you've connected it to yeah, your studies at Middlebury and, and philosophy and consciousness. And yeah, it has a great connection with cognitive science. So um, it would actually be great to catch up with you sometime and see see where you're going with this. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's fantastic. So um, let's take a look at the you know next discussion point, um, and maybe maybe you really just touched on this one for us to get us started, Weston. But you know what, what's a big idea that really stuck with you? Um, maybe there was something new that you learned. Maybe there are some questions that you still have. You know, Josh, when you think about this. What, what were some of the big ideas that that were um, that you found impactful? So um, like Weston, I, I think it was that that idea of self one and self two that was probably the biggest takeaway for me. I, I know it. And I think he introduces that in, in the first couple of chapters. I think it's chapter two where he starts to make that distinction. Yes. And he, he talks about how people often say that. You know, you listen to the way that somebody talks to themselves. And in ten, tennis is a sport where people, we, we, we have a, we, we get an insight into what somebody's saying inside their head because they often will say things out loud as well. So people will say, you know, why can't you make your backhand? Or what are you doing? Or you need to get up to the ball or things like that. Or I need to, they might use the word I. But Tim Galloway makes the point Who's, who's talking to who here? It's the, the same person, right? So he he separates it um, into two different selves, a self one and a self two. Self one really being the, the one who's doing the talking or doing the instructing and self two, um, which I've always sort of thought about as the body. And Weston, I like how you made the more the neuroscience connection there. Um, but yeah, self two more being the doer. Um, and yeah, really what, what I, what resonated with me was just, um, how we, we can start to hopefully become more aware of what's, what's taking place moment by moment, especially when we're on the court and can we start to notice, you know, what's going, what's going, what is our experience like moment by moment? And, you know, are we judging ourselves? Are we telling ourselves what to do? If so, that's, that's self one at play, or are we letting ourselves let go and and more so do what we know how to do? You know, if you've played, if you've been on, if you've spent enough time on a tennis court, you, you know enough about the sport to, to play it. Um, but we often get into our own way. And I think it really is self one that, that tends to do that, that tends to get in the way through this constant talking and this constant judgment and this constant instruction and it's almost like we're micromanaging ourselves in a certain way rather than trusting our abilities we're micromanaging them and telling ourselves you know get up to the ball move your feet you know get your racket back all these things that really we know how to do so you know can we start finding a way to to quiet that that part of things to quiet self one yeah i think the self one self two pieces yeah, maybe back in 1990 was the breathing, but now it's really become a lot, a lot about that. And the trust factor between the two is, you know, how can we help players to develop that trust more? You know, people get the whole self one, self two concept, I think, in general. Um, but through quieting the mind, which could be the breathing piece. Uh, using visual images as a means of correction and learning, um, knowing that an image just conveys so much more information than a stream of 
of words. And it would take, you know, if we, if we were to show a five second clip of a forehand, we could probably write, you know, 1200 words about what's going on in this clip. You don't have time to regurgitate 1200 words between points, but you can see an image that communicates so much more information. And if we can use that as our natural learning process, that, that to me was really an important piece. Um, because we are judging a lot, we are talking to ourselves a lot, and all that talk begins to create doubt in our, in you know, our self two's ability to to play the game. And it's interesting, Josh, as we look at how Galway teaches, and I think you you have shared a video, I think, of how Tim Tim Galway was teaching putting to somebody. Was that only like sixty minutes or something? And you know, there's not a lot of talking going on there. Um, and we did do an episode with Sean Brawley, who is an associate of, of Tim Galway in terms of the inner game of coaching and so forth. So that that's a good one for people to listen to. But I find it interesting, Josh, that when we look at the tennis world and the tennis coaching world, it's still highly verbal. There isn't necessarily a sh- or hasn't been necessarily a shift to modeling. Um, we, I think we have more opportunities now with technology to use video, but um, I was talking to a, a player yesterday who was working with like a legendary coach. It was all verbal. There was no modeling of it. And so we talked about, all right, hey, can you maybe ask him to model it? Um, or can you get video of you doing it so that you can begin to see that in your own mind? Um, and so I think... This, this really changed the game in terms of how we think about learning and, and that tennis is, it's not a question of reading and knowing, it's an experience. It's experiencing true knowing through the act of playing and really tuning into how does my forehand feel when it's at its best? Not describing it in terms of this is the take back, this is the wrist angle, this is the grip I use. It's all right, can I turn that into a feeling and then know what that feeling is when I experience it, right? Um, anybody else want to jump in on, on, on self one, self two um, and their experience with that? Or any other ideas in the book that were new or you know, maybe there were some parts of the book that, that were unclear? Okay. I'll, I'll add one more point. Go um, ahead, Weston. Yeah, that's fine. J- j- just back to um, what Josh was saying about how um, Galloway, uh, Galloway kind of makes the distinction um, between self one and self two as two kind of separate concepts. What, one thing I struggle with a bit was that he kind of takes that dualist approach to it, um, even though it's the same person, right? And so like, I think that's a mechanism of explanation through the language, right? Because like, how else could you kind of explain it? But like, in a sense, it's not quite what he means, right? Because they're kind of merging, right? Um, and it's like, I don't, I don't know, sometimes I struggle with like the basic dualist kind of aspect of that. Although I, I can see the sides to it. But um, it's just like, it's almost like it can't quite be communicated what he's really saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's a tough like, um, yeah, it's gonna be tough to like wrap your head around it, but maybe that's just self one overanalyzing. So I don't know. Could be, yeah. <laughs> I think you could also look at it, Weston, like from a stages of learning perspective. Um, yeah. you know, where the the third and fourth stages of learning are conscious competence, where we're more consciously thinking about what we're doing. And the last stage of learning is unconscious competence, which is when something really has been, you know, transferred to that longer term, you know, learning and memory part of the brain so that we recall that motor program without really having to think about it. It's more intuitive Mm -hmm. and instinctual. And in order for somebody, something to get there though, you mean think about your own game as a, as a young player, when you first learned to hit a kick serve, you had to think about it. You, you, you probably had to go through some, talking through and feeling it and because it wasn't quite totally learned yet 
Yeah. Unfortunately, you know. in that example, I still can't hit, hit a kick serve very well. So I don't that, that one that. I never got, but I don't believe that. <laughs> this is an example. <laughs> I see what it is. Not the kick. I've got the slice, but it's part of the reason why. Yeah. I'd love, love to have a better kick. <laughs> yeah. Well, at, you know, I don't know how tall you are now, but when you and I knew each other, you were pretty tall. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Let's move on to the next, um, the next question. Um, maybe winning ugly is one of these, but you know, were there some other books or ideas that you were reminded of going through this? We, we've talked about mindfulness. Weston's brought up some stuff about philosophy and cognitive science. Um, Josh, any other books come to mind for you when you, when you think about this game? I went through, I, I, I printed my notes from the book and I, I found a couple, uh, areas where I, it helped me connect to some other books that I've read. Um, one other that 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 I think it, it connects to for me, and actually uh, Tim mentions this book is Zen and the Art of Archery, mm. where um, if people are familiar, it sort of outlines a, a similar some similar concepts about how sometimes when we are trying too hard, um, it can actually have it, it can have negative consequences when we're trying too hard and tensing. Um, it can hold, you know, it can hold us back when we can, you know, let go and sort of let things, let things happen, um, a little bit more and, and trust our process. Um, we, we tend to perform a lot better. So I know he mentioned that, um, as well. And I, I think that's a, it, it, I would say if you like the inner game of tennis in this, that style of book, I, I think you would definitely enjoy that book as well. Yeah. Cause the style of this book is a little bit Zen-like. And I think that was one of the things when I first read it was, or maybe I held off reading it for so long was I wasn't sure I was comfortable with that style. A um, couple of books that I was reminded of. Um, there's a passage on page 19 where um, he says, if you tell yourself often enough that you are a poor server, a kind of hypnotic process takes place. It's as if self too is being given a role to play, the role of bad server. And then of course it plays it to perfection. And this made me think of a book called With Winning in Mind, which was written by Lenny Basham. Lenny Basham was a Olympic uh, gold medal winning uh, rifle shooter and a fantastic book. And he brings up the concept of something he calls the self-image. And for him, developing one's self-image is an important part of developing your, your mental game. And he says that if you have a poor self-image, it is difficult, if not impossible, to outperform that self-image, which is exactly what Galway is saying here. If you think of yourself as a poor server, how can you expect to go out and have a great day serving? Because that's your image. And so that, that was one area where um, I was reminded of a book. And the other one is a book that you have also read, Josh, uh, Mindset by Jackie Reardon. And this is right after page 20. Um, Judgmental labels usually lead to emotional reactions and then tightness, trying to guard, self-condemnation, etc. This process can be slowed by, by using descriptive but non-judgmental words to describe the events you see. So it made me think that there's a concept in Mindset by Jackie Reardon, which he calls story thinking, where you begin to think negatively and then you start to craft a story around whatever is happening. It might be like, oh, I'm such a bad server. I can't get any serves in. I'm going to lose this match. Everybody's going to know what a bad server or a bad player I am. And your mind spins off into a story and it leads to overthinking. So self one is really kind of going, going crazy here. Um, those are both books that I would highly recommend if you're looking to improve your mental game and, and, and your approach. Uh, obviously with winning in mind is more of a generic look at mental training but Mindset by Jackie Reardon is actually very directed towards tennis players. She's a former uh, tennis professional from the UK, and uh, she does a lot of coaching. Uh, she, in fact, I think coached Tarot Daniel for, for a little bit. Um, 
And it's a fantastic book that really is probably for me, Josh, I don't know. I think it's one of the best books I've read in terms of how to train mental skills on the court. So I think I would highly recommend that, that book. Um, anyone else reminded of other concepts or other books uh, when you, when you went through this one? Um, um, can you guys see me? Yes. Okay. Hi, one book that I, um, helped me out was also the, the talent code. I know it was a little more about like biomechanics, but it also kind of, um, I thought was really good as, in terms of like, uh, focusing during your practice, making sure that you're, I have a hundred percent for a short time, then like 70% for a longer amount of time. And so that was really good for me, even when I train or when I do my workouts, that if I, um, to then make sure that I'm training to make sure it's very intentional. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, deliberate practice is, is something that's really, really important. And uh, certainly the talent code by Dan, Daniel Coyles is, is a great book for, for explaining that. So thank you. Yes, Bruce. I don't remember the titles, but uh, Jeff Greenwald has a book, a collection of almost essays, yeah. which really talks about the breathing and playing with gratitude and feeling, you know, the 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 dirt or the, the court underneath your feet. And it's all about, you know, yeah. that self too. Yes, there it is. The best that tennis self- of your life, 50 mental strategies for fearless performance. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I, I found that was very interesting. And also, I don't mean to put him on the spot, but uh, Brian has a very good book of a collection of essays as well uh, that he has put together, which, again, goes through that whole self, too, and how you get the best out of yourself by really focusing uh, not on the technique, but rather on the mental aspect of the game. Thank you, Bruce. All right, and Josh, you put in the chat there, you've got that 60 minute piece. Yeah, so maybe we can share that when we share the episode, this this with everybody else, we could put that link in there. Yeah, yeah, there's a, um, and I can just say, so So for, first of all, you mentioned the golf piece. So first Tim wrote the book on um, inner game of tennis. And then later there was inner game of golf and there's two videos and I, I can share both of them, um, after, and if, if we have a couple minutes towards the end, I could even, you know, share my screen for a second, but, um, the tennis one, which was on 60 minutes, it, he is working with a absolute beginner, a player who had never, never played before at all. And within about 10 minutes or so sort of using his method of not doing a whole lot of instructing at all, but more so letting her watch how, watch his form, visualize what, what um, he was doing and just try to, to replicate it essentially. And, you know, maybe with certain guidance here and there uh, within a very short amount of time, she was, you know, making good contact, seemed to be hitting somewhat consistently so that's the first one and the second one is is the golf putting video so anyways i'd be happy to happy to share both great thank you all right let's move on to the next one um now this one we obviously would have to have uh maybe access to your book or 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 not um but josh do you have a favorite quote or passage from the book yeah, I do. I actually have a couple that are here. Um, here it is. Um, so I like when he's talks sort of making comparisons to how um, pe- sort of the state of mind that the tennis players tend to be in when they're at their best. And generally when people are at their best, there's not a whole lot of thinking that's that's going that, that's taking place there, there's definitely exceptions um but but generally there's actually less thinking it's more um sort of subconsciously you know letting the subconscious take over and more so trusting trusting that 
Um, and he makes the comparison to a cat, to a cat that's um, leaping after a bird. And so here's the quote. Um, Effortless, effortlessly alert, he crouches, gathering his relaxed muscles for the spring, not thinking about when to jump, nor how he will push off with his hind legs to attain the proper distance. His mind is still and perfectly concentrated on his prey. No thought flashes into his consciousness of the possibility or consequences of missing his mark. He only he sees only the bird. Suddenly, the bird takes off. At the same instant, the cat leaps. With perfect anticipation, he intercepts his dinner two feet off of the ground. Perfectly, thoughtlessly executed action. And afterwards, no self-congratulations, just the reward inherent in his action, the bird in his mouth. You like that? I know, and both of my parents are, are here, and it, it did remind me of our of our former cat, Paws, who was spent a lot of time outdoors and we we did find plenty of dead birds in our in our yard over the years um yes plenty um but i i really like that quote because it felt you know i, I think it it was a, a great comparison to the flow experience that many people have experienced not you know now and then maybe what at one point or you know a, a handful of times um, where rather than thinking about all the aspects of your performance in terms of your technique, in terms of your opponent, in terms of yourself, in terms of what might happen if I win, what might happen if I lose, why did I go for that shot last game on deuce point, um, just more so being present, being present, being fully immersed in the activity. And, you know, I, I think it, it made a really nice comparison to to the the experience of, the cat in in full fully present in the moment yeah it's hard to know how you know if a cat can be fully uh <laughs> does this cat have self one i don't know but uh how much it judges things it probably is a very instinctual animal but there's a lot to learn from that isn't there yeah that's a good one um anybody else have a particular quote or or passage or idea I, I do have one as well, but I want to give people a chance. Um, so I will uh, share one. I think kind of we've discussed this um, concept already. Um, but this is more on the coaching side. I think it's somewhat, but also when you're coaching yourself. So um, it is dangerous to make that person's stroke or any stroke description into your standard for right and wrong. Self one easily gets enamored of formulas that tell it where the racket should be and when. It likes the feeling of control it gets, it gets from doing it by the book. But self two likes the feeling of flow, of the whole stroke is one thing. The inner game is an encouragement to keep in touch with the self two learning process you were born with while avoiding getting caught up in trying too hard to make your strokes conform to an outside model. Use outside models in your learning, but don't let them use you. Natural learning is and always will be from the inside out, not vice versa. You are the learner, and it is your individual internal learning process that ultimately governs your learning. And I don't know if this is exactly where I got it from, Josh, but it's certainly a reinforcement of like when we work with players to respect the individual experience. And when we look at various professional tennis players, we see that they all have different strokes. Um, you know, whenever I'm confronted with this, this thought of, is there a right way to hit a forehand? I just think of Daniil Medvedev. No one is teaching anybody Daniil Medvedev ground strokes because I would think they're very difficult to emulate. But he wakes them work somehow. And so he's, a, to me, a perfect example of the individual nature of the mechanics of tennis. And that for him, it's not about where the racket is. And, you know, he's got a lot going on prior to contact, but um, he makes it happen. And there's a feeling I'm sure that he has when he's playing. Um, so I think that quote actually contains a lot of things that we have 
we've talked about throughout this process. Um, and, you know, I probably could have chosen a bunch, but I thought that one was actually something that encapsulated a lot of different concepts that we've, we've already gone through. Do you have any thoughts on that one, Josh? I, I like that, that quote a lot. I think it, it reminds me of a different point that, um, that Tim was making about the, you know, not judging too much. And, and I, he made it through a couple of other comparisons where at one point he talks about how when, you know, a baby or a toddler, I guess, is, is learning how to walk, um, you know, rather than constantly um, criticizing, you know, it's not like the parents are saying, oh, come on, what are you doing? You know, get up and, and walk. It's no, that's, you know, the, the, the baby is not criticizing themselves. They're, they're just trying again. They're going about that simple learning process. And, and um, I think he makes the, a similar comparison at one point to, to a flower. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, when a, here's the quote, when a, when we plant a rose seed in the earth, we notice that it's small, but we don't criticize it as rootless and stemless. We treat it as a seed, giving it the water and nourishment required of a seed. And then he continues with that. But it's it's sort of like, you know, give yourself that time and that space to develop rather than constantly judging and criticizing, rather than constantly comparing yourself to some gold standard or some perfect, you know, I think for a long time, people looked at the Federer form as as perfect, right? Or or as close to perfect as uh, there could be. And I think people would compare themselves to that. And I, I, I'm glad you brought up Medvedev because he does a lot of unorthodox things out there, but he makes it work. And, you know, I think many players have that experience where there's, you know, you can be very successful without perfect strokes, without orthodox looking strokes. And you just have to figure out how to make it work. And I think oftentimes that involves more so than necessarily just working on your form and just working on your form and spending countless hours trying to perfect something that maybe can't actually be perfected. Um, learning to play with what you have and, and make it work and yeah, without constantly judging it. Yeah. The, the baby comparison is very interesting, Josh, because imagine if the baby had sort of the ego and the cognitive development of an older person we would have a lot of people crawling around right <laughs> not everybody would have learned to walk um and so I, yeah that is that is a good one um there's a guy named brian johnson he uh had a website called philosopher's notes some years ago he's now sort of transitioned to something he calls heroic and uh, is helping people optimize but he has a great um note or video on youtube where he goes through some big ideas about the inner game of tennis and one is uh you were just sort of alluding to it josh the idea of of judging um and and galway brings up the point of when we make a mistake not assigning too much value as like a good or a bad thing so let's say you hit a ball in the net um, many of us would judge that as, as bad. We don't want that. But the reality is, is that the ball simply went in the net. Um, can you look at that more as a neutral event and, and then simply learn to correct it? You might even correct it via a visual image. You may visualize what would the perfect shot have looked like and then when you don't attach that much emotion to it, you can move on more quickly. You know, we get very attached to uh, events in which we associate negative emotion to. It becomes harder to get over that stuff. Um, and so Galway talks about here, when you make mistakes, make an effort not to assign too much value to it. Try to look at it simply as a, as a neutral event uh, so that you can get through it more quickly and, and then on to the next, on to the next point. Um, so Brian Johnson in his video, his summary of the inner game of tennis really does a good job of explaining that whole concept and, and, and ways of, of quieting the mind. Um, anybody else want to jump in on this particular it, talking? I'd like to, I'd like to say something. Hi, my name is Lewis Volpe. I'm up in Redding, California. And 
Damon and Amy are my coaches up here in Reading and uh, they were, they used to teach in San Francisco. And so she invited me to come on the call and this is really great because she's got me reading the inner book or the inner game of tennis. Fantastic. Uh, listening to it on audible and it's really, really a great, great read. And it challenges me every single day. And so as I'm listening to you guys talk, I'm thinking about how I view myself as a new player. And when I make a good shot, it's great because you get a really good feeling that comes over you. And when you make a bad shot, like you said, it was a moment or, um, you know, it was a, a good or a bad moment and you can learn from it. So last night we played and I, I missed a lot of shots that just went out of bounds or maybe hit the top of the net and deflected out of bounds. And, and I didn't look at it as bad last night, even though I didn't win any games last night, <laughs> I looked at it as though, as I see myself inside or in my heart, so am I. We've all heard that saying, as a man think of, of himself in his heart, so is he. So I see myself playing the game um, in a way that I'm winning, that I'm making the right shots, I'm doing the right backhand. She's teaching me a double backhand. And I'm seeing myself following through and the ball going in the right spot on the court. And I see myself winning. And I think it's important that we see ourselves actually play this out in our mind, like when we're in bed, laying there in bed or sometimes I daydream during the day and I see myself actually playing the game the way the game's supposed to be played. And I'm, it's really starting to work because there's times where I have total victory on the court. And there's other times where you, it might not look like victory to someone else, but to me, I'm working, I'm working out my victory myself. And so I'm excited because she turned me on to that book and that book is helping me with person one and person two and those personalities and the way I, I do things. So uh, I see myself becoming a really, really good court player. And, uh, you know, you guys having these calls, I think is awesome because what it's doing is it's challenging each other to see yourself in a different light and see your peers in a different light. So uh, Amy, Damon, thank you so much for having me on this call. And I want to uh, say thank you guys for what you guys are doing to help this community. I think you guys are doing a great thing here. So thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, there was a ton of wisdom in there, Josh. You know, any you have any comments for for Lewis? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, thank you, Lewis. Um, we had last, uh, I think it was the first master class. We had somebody that used uh, my link, the, the link that I used. So they were they were Josh Berger for that. <laughs> I think Lewis, you you're uh, in that same boat this time as as Amy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I I worked with with Amy and Damon over in San Francisco. Um, coaching together and saw had the pleasure of seeing them both last year at Wimbledon, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of wisdom in there. Instead of you know whatever level you're at, um, finding ways to get out of your own head as you're playing and not constantly judging and enjoying that process of getting better. And of you know, there's yeah. going to be certain days where you're, where you're feeling great and everything's going great. There's going to be certain days where it's not, and that's the same, you know, that, that is true for a beginner player. That's true of an intermediate advanced player. And that's true of the best players in the world. It, it looks a little differently for players dif of different levels, but I think everyone experiences both sides of that in their own way. So um, yeah, I think, you know, being able to trust that process, being able to, you know, put that judgment aside and put the, uh, yeah. self one aside as much as possible. And to, I think, be aware. And, and I think that's maybe a point that I want to make as well, that, you know, it, it all really starts with awareness. Can we be aware of when self one is, is at the wheel, so to speak, you know, when is self one in charge? And once we're aware of it, then we can start to do something about it until we're aware of that. There's, there's very little we can, we can actually do, but thank you for, for sharing that. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And one of the, I heard a couple of things in there. Victory is really almost the experience, right? The, yeah. right. Going out and experiencing it as a victory. Cause this is a, this is a journey. This is, you know, whatever match you played the other day is not like the Olympics. It's not the end. It's not your retirement match. There's more. There's, we're going to build on it. So we, you have to go out and experience all of this. And that that's the true victory is that we've had the courage to experience this stuff and, and be a learner, be a student and, and do that. And then the visualizing piece, I think is fantastic. You know, you're really tapping into something that a lot of the late athletes have done so well is to, and, and Novak Djokovic actually mentioned this in his 
victory speech after Roland Garros, this idea of seeing himself being successful and feeling it in every cell of his body and that that helped him to really be in control of his destiny. So the more that you are visualizing and feeling this stuff, the more it will start to manifest itself on the court. It, it really can't help but do that. And so I just encourage you to keep keep experiencing, experiencing the game, keep learning it, and, and then certainly keep visualizing it. I think that's a, a wonderful habit to, to keep going here. All right. Next. Uh, we've done that. So based on maybe even some of our discussion tonight, does anybody have any ideas about you know, big learnings from the book and how you'd like to apply it, maybe in terms of that deliberate practice? Is there something you, you want to jump on the court tomorrow and start start doing a little bit a little bit better based on on some of the things that you read or even tonight's discussion points? Yes, Griffin, I think you're on mute, on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is kind of having like a visual image of like your forehand before you go into a match and being like a competitive player. That's something like I really try to work on is like visualization before like my match, like the day before and then like kind of in the minutes before as well. Um, and also kind of like, feeling the ball more than actually trying to like think and hit it and I actually like underlined um one passage I forget where it was but I just said like feel the ball rather than think because when you think too much and you overthink which is something I uh do commonly in a lot of my matches is uh then you just lose sight of the ball and you don't really like it just it doesn't go well for you and so when you try to feel like what does your racket feel like what does the ball feel like when you hit topspin or slice or whatever um when you do that it you can you'll see a like big improvement in the types of shots um and one more thing i actually have tried in a match before uh on seven he says like the next time your opponent is having a hot streak in a certain area simply ask him as you switch courts and say like what are you doing so differently that makes your forehand so good today and they say like if he takes the bait and 95 percent will he and begins to think about how he's swinging telling you uh how he's really meeting the ball out in front keeping his wrist firm and falling through better his streak invariably will end he will lose his timing and fluidity as he tries to repeat what he has to just told you he was doing so well and I've actually tried that uh, in a match before, and it worked pretty well, and I ended up winning. So it's it's a <laughs> fun, and I don't I don't know if it's cheating or not, but it's a fun and interesting strategy to use. So yeah, it's potentially bordering on gamesmanship there, Griffin, but that's okay. It was good for you to exper to experiment with it and see it live, yeah, <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and see if you can trust that. Um, so I I think there's nothing wrong with 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 doing that. Um, I like the idea of visualizing. I like the idea of feel. And in fact, if I could, you know, give you one thing to to think about a little bit more is when you warm up for matches, work on feel more if you don't already, right? Really, the point of the warm up isn't to be perfect. The point of the warm up is to is to develop your feel for today, so that when the first point starts, you've already had it. Yeah, that's a good idea. But thank you for that, uh, Rob. Yeah. Rob Park. Uh, yeah. So, well, and also, uh, as you always say, Brian, it, it, you know, it, it's war, it's a battle like that. It's uh, right. It's hand to hand yeah. combat when we're playing tennis. So I guess in that respect, like uh, that kind of gamesmanship, I'm actually pretty cool with <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty good idea. Um, uh, let's see. So the thing that was, Actually, before this call even came up on my radar, I, I've been occasionally thinking about like the bounce hit thing is the thing that really, I don't know, that's been the big thing that I always kind of remember and having seen, I forget the other guy's name, the guy that, uh, that has worked with, with oh, Galloway before. Yeah, Sean Brawley. Yeah, Sean Brawley. And having watched a couple of his videos of just doing the bounce hit thing, um, but 
having learned about split steps later in life too, um, both of those things, they just slow everything down so much. Like in that instant of time, it's almost like Neo in the Matrix where like all of a sudden I start watching the ball and I can kind of see the ball and then I'm actually hitting the ball as opposed to just watching it whiz by. Um, so, so to me, that that's like that's been one of the, the really big things. Um, it's just in trying to do I've been trying to do some bit of bounce hit, especially during like mini tennis and the warm up. Yes. But I'm starting to think I should be probably more th <laughs> thinking about bounce hit, especially when I'm, I'm just kind of uh, in one of those moments. I don't know. Maybe anybody else has these moments where you just feel like you're kind of flailing around out there and you're trying to just kind of get it under control. Yeah. It's a great way to become more present. Right. When exactly. you're breathing right. or watching the ball that way, watching the spin of the ball. And you mentioned the temporal piece, you know, Weston referred to that earlier. It's you be, when you when you do that, time may may slow down for you, as you've noted, Rob. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Bruce. It, it is amazing. I just have a couple points. It is amazing when self two takes over. That ball looks the size of a grapefruit, you know, and it just, you know, the flow just goes and just seems like that ball is so large. And, and uh, to Rob's point, it's going so slowly, even if somebody's hitting, you know, a, a very fast serve at you, it just slows down. Um, and, you know, I think to uh, Griffin's point, you know, what I'm going to take away from this you know, that whole visualization and, you know, really get video of when you're playing well, splice it together and use that, you know, almost to from into muscle memory um, for either prior to the game, prior to going on the court or even, you know, uh, during a, a changeover or something, you know, be able to, to take a look at uh, how you're doing or, how, when you're doing it well, I'm I'm talking about you know during practice sessions. For sure, yeah, video is a great way to do that in the visualization. Just like we were saying earlier, I think that that is good, Bruce. Yeah, to do that as part of your preparation and get yourself into that headspace. Josh, any any comments on what we've heard? No, no, I and I, I think um, yeah, being able to visualize what you want to happen out there and really have that that clear image and be able to sort of rehearse mentally rehearse what you want to happen um yeah i mean there, there's a lot of you know research that 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 shows its effectiveness and i think you know this is a book again that came out right around 50 years ago and you know before a lot of that research was out there and you know, I, th I think sort of laid the the groundwork for a lot of the things that have come after. But I think, yeah, being able to um, to visualize it and more so rely on something like that rather than the constant telling yourself what to do, I think can be can be really effective. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, this is one of the you know seminal books in all of mental performance, whether it's tennis or any other sport, and. Um, it's one of those books that, yeah, it's worth a read more than one time to go through and and really just study it and understand. Oh, we have another question. Yes. Cindy. I think you're on mute. Hi, guys. Um, actually, I'm here as a as a listener. I'm from Brazil. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm a tennis fan. And I, I just have a question. Do you have any like techniques to use when you're playing and self one uh, appears to quiet self one and make the game easier, like fast technique? Hmm. Want to take that one, Josh? I can, uh, I can take a stab at it. Um, I think there's a couple things. I think some of the things that we've talked about, like you know, redirecting your focus on the ball, for instance, um, as one idea. Um, I think another is to really notice 
what's taking place. Notice, okay, self one is in charge here. Self one's talking a lot. Um, um, and can we, can we start to notice, am I judging? Am I judging things as good and bad? Am I judging each shot that I have as good and is good or bad? Or am I taking a different approach of just trying to see things as they are more objectively? And once we can do that, we can start to, to learn from each situation. So I think, you know, trying to really make a conscious effort to more so just see objectively what's happening and to try to learn from each shot and just see what happened. Okay, I hit the ball into the net. Now, self one might say, oh, your backhand is is horrible, right? What what am I doing? I always do that. But maybe there's another way. Okay, I hit the ball into the net. What does that mean? Maybe I have to get under the ball more. Maybe I, I should be trying to hit the ball with more net clearance. Maybe I went for the wrong shot. Maybe I didn't get my feet set. So once we can try, you know, see it more objectively and and really prioritize trying to learn from the situation, I think it can help us get out of that self one state of mind. Okay. I like that. Um, I'm often asked this question, Cindy, like, what, what do I do when things are not working? And to me, the answer is a lot about trying to make your body feel better. So first of all, like take yourself back to when you're not playing well, you're probably feeling levels of tension. You're probably overly emotional in this particular moment. You may be overthinking that process, right? Self one is, 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 is thinking too much. So the idea would be to simplify what we're doing. So really the first step there is, is to try to take some centering breaths to get out of our overthinking and more to maybe a place of thinking more correctly, thinking rightly. And then how do we make our bodies feel better? Well, the breathing is a good way to begin to kick that off establish some coherence with the mind. So some rhythmic breathing, but we could start bouncing up and down a little bit, maybe shake out the muscles in the arms and the legs to release some tension. We may simplify what we do down to simply watching the ball. Maybe that's bounce hit. Maybe it's seeing the seams of the ball. Um, maybe we have a very simple self-talk script, but I like to use that as a, uh, almost like a mantra. So it could be something like breathe, watch the ball, next point, breathe, watch the ball, next point, and repeating that. Uh, so I think as, if we can be simplifying what we're doing, um, using some of the, the tools that Galway talks about, such as breathing, watching the ball, visualizing our corrections, um, those are more effective than, say, tactical or strategic changes, and certainly than technical. The match is not a place to begin to discuss technique with yourself. You'll be lost at that point because it won't be automatic. Um, and that can be tough for players to hear. Like, oh, well, it must be more complex <laughs> solution than that. Like, no, it's really not. If you can simplify what you're doing as exactly what, what Galway was talking about in the one quote I, I brought out, um, you just allow your body to do what it knows how to do, right? Self one is, is the biggest source of interference that there is. So, you know, in, in his book, the inner game of work, he came up with a, a formula that we've used in the podcast, which says actual performance equals your potential performance minus cognitive interference, meaning self one. So we have to understand what the sources of interference are and how do we reduce those? So a lot of what we've just discussed today are ways of reducing self one's interference in that overall. If we can do that, then our actual could become a lot closer to our potential. So I hope that was helpful from both of us. Awesome. Thank you. So so we're coming, you know, to the end. I uh, just wanted to make one pitch for, um, you know, why we're doing this. You know, so we open this this particular book club discussion to to everyone. Um, but if you enjoyed this, you know, consider uh, joining our community. So we have a, a level of support in which we uh, open this type of discussion op op uh, to to people who are supporting the podcast. And our goal is to have these types of talks 
every quarter, you know, so four a year. Um, and we'll go through a similar process where we'll, we'll probably pick a book that may be a little bit newer. So people will actually have to read it. And so uh, mm -hmm. in order to prepare for it. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to make a quick pitch. If, you, if you're interested in, in supporting the podcast and, and participating in this, you can go to our, our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. So, and we would appreciate any support. So with that, I know we're a little past uh, nine o'clock Eastern time. I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for showing up. This was a really great discussion. Um, and uh, Josh, anything you want to say in closing? No, no, really great discussion. We appreciate all of you joining us from, from, lots of different places. So uh, yeah, we appreciate that. I can share the video that I mentioned, the, the tennis one um, with Tim Galway, watching him, you know, we talked about, um, you know, showing rather than telling, right? So being able to see actually him in action and how he gave a lesson. I think the video is about 12 minutes long, but even if you just check out, I think the first uh, three, four or five minutes, I think you'll, you'll definitely get the idea. So I can put that um both in the chat right now so if anybody wants to just you know check it out now if you have a couple minutes or um at some point later i think you'd definitely enjoy just watching how he approaches working with an absolute beginner and uh really the, the very quick progress that's made in utilizing some of the things that we talked about like uh bounce hit and and that sort of thing and not doing a lot of instruction but yeah. we really appreciate everyone's time uh hope you took something away from it and uh and yeah, feel free to reach out to us with uh, with any questions about anything. We have actually a question from Toby. So we'll take one last comment. Hello, I'm from Chico, California. Yeah, it's about six o'clock here. Yes. And my question, not so much a question, but um, positive comment. As I'm a, a graduating student from uh, Butte College and have not played tennis, but have played stoop ball and a little tennis when I was a lot younger. But the concept of getting out of your own way really intrigues me. And this can be applied to most anything in life that you try to do, set your mind to do or to accomplish um, and just letting go of preconceived notions and especially the judging because this conversation has brought to the forefront of my mind of that getting out of my own way. Um, it's so pre prevalent in other aspects of life um, that can be applied. And I really appreciate this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Toby. That might be like the most brilliant way to summarize the whole thing and <laughs> close close the meeting. That was fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much. And and thanks everybody for, for coming. This is really enjoyable. And um, we hope to see you soon. We'll send everybody, even if you were here, we'll send you a copy of the recording and um, and, and the links that Josh mentioned. All right. And and one, one thing I would just say, uh and to uh, in response to what Toby said, it definitely applies beyond tennis. I I think that's absolutely true. I actually know two two individuals. One is a one is an actor, and one is a uh, high level musician. And both of them had this book um, as part of their their coursework in school. So on the performance side, both as as an actor and as a as a uh, performing artist as a musician, um, they were both they both read this book in their classes and I think of their collegiate classes. Um, and yeah, so I, I think is it definitely applies beyond tennis. And, you know, I think there's definitely moments to um, apply it in, in other areas of life. And yeah, thank you for that comment, Toby. And I hope you can uh, give tennis a try. I would definitely suggest checking out the video as well and watching how Tim Galway approaches a lesson. Cause I think there's a lot to, to be okay. learning. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.